Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to Maya HTT's Swift Random and Sign Vibration Analysis Webinar. My name is John Shu. I'll be your presenter for today. I'm the Simulation Services Director at Maya HTT. That means I head up the group that does all of our finite element analysis, CFD, uh, thermal analysis, electromagnetic analysis, and so on. So let me start by asking the question, why should you pay attention to me today? I want to let you know that what you can get out of this is to understand how to get more accurate results significantly faster for your random and signed vibration analysis. And if you're new to random and signed vibration analysis, I'll cover some of the basics, try and get you up to speed a little bit. Um, if you've already been doing sign um, and random analysis, I'll talk about our structural analysis toolkit or SA toolkit or SATK that you can use to, as I said, get these results faster and more accurately. And if you're already a user of our tool, um, hopefully you'll still learn a little bit here and we can make sure you're using it efficiently. To start off, I wanted to give a little bit of an intro of Maya. We are a software-driven engineering solutions company. We're a number one global partner with Siemens Digital Industries software. So a lot of the NX, SimCenter software, and everything in, within that portfolio. We actually um, author over 30 software modules for Siemens. That means our developers actually write the code and we're the uh, world experts with those. 75% of our staff are scientists and engineers, and we started in space. That's where we started about 40 years ago, um, and then from there have branched off into almost every engineering uh, industry there is. A little more about us uh, digging into the company and how we operate. We have three main parts. So we're an engineering software development company. Um, that's writing code. We're a digital solution distributor, so we uh, sell the Siemens products and our own products as well, like SAPK. And then we also have a consulting and integration group. Um, that's where you're going to get, like my group, doing the services. Um, you'll, we have an AI and IoT group, a group for PLM, and customization group that can do customization with NX Open or any other software that you need. Um, all three of these groups work really closely together. It allows us to be very agile and help our customers um, with any of their digital solutions. And you can see over on the right side, the areas that we do cover from PLM to design, simulation, manufacturing, AI and IoT, software development and automation. So let's start this off with a question here. Uh, I wanted to ask, what is your experience with sign and random vibration? And I will go ahead and launch a question here. You'll see it pop up on your screen. And if you don't mind just answering, uh, clicking, choosing one of the answers there. I'm always interested to see the uh, level of experience with the audience that we're seeing see some results coming in. I'll close the poll here in just a second and share those with you. All right, we'll go ahead and close that and I will share that for you so you can see. Uh, you can see the um, majority of our audience familiar with it or have done it before and then uh, uh, some really experienced users as well. So hopefully we'll we'll make this useful for everyone today here. Now, let's talk about our agenda, what we're going to cover. I'll talk first about why we care about vibration. I'll then give an intro to our structural analysis tool, toolkit. And I'll do uh, cover some of the processors that are within that toolkit. And then we'll do a live demo for you as well. So taking a, a bigger step back, why do we care about vibration? Let's talk first about where vibrations come from. 
So you can have vibrations. Some of the examples of uh, the a car's tires and suspension interacting with the surface of a road causes vibration. Uh, plane in flight, the, the air buffeting around it causing vibration. And then on landing, takeoff, uh, the engines on the plane. Or a uh, rocket launch, you have the satellite sitting at the top of the rocket, getting hit by all the acoustic energy, the vibrations from the engines of the rocket themselves, and any aerodynamic loads as well. What all these provide are a um, basically a amplitude, a acceleration over time, and that's your time history, and that's what we're using when we're considering the environment that the um, whatever component you're looking at sees. And then if we step back and look at the engineering development process as a whole, let's see how vibration fits into there. So you have the requirements at the beginning of your design phase. And let's use an example of a, of a spacecraft. It would be sitting in the rocket and you, you'll get requirements um, up front. These are the design requirements you need to meet. These are meant to envelope the environment that the spacecraft is expected to see. So you'll get something like a sound pressure level curve for the acoustic energy. You'll get a an acceleration curve that you need to meet for usually from zero to 100 hertz. And then you'll get a PSD, power spectral density, or a, you know, for your random vibration that's caused. Um, and you can see, you know, the low frequencies might be caused by the coupling with the rocket, uh, sine vibration driven. The sort of mid frequencies might be caused by air acoustics. Uh, the higher frequencies are or cause structure borne vibration. Um, but all these couple in to go to a random vibration profile that you have to design your spacecraft to. And once you have your requirements, you move to the design and analysis phase. And so within that phase, you'll take those requirements you had, you're actually trying to design your system to that, and you might do some analysis. And that's what we're going to be primarily talking about today. Um, in this instance, it's we're talking about base-driven random and sine vibration. So that's where the vibrational input the, is driven into the component or the system or the spacecraft at, at a base that is at a single point. In this instance, the um, connection of the spacecraft to the rocket, you might connect with something like a, if you're talking Nastran, a rigid body element here, and that's where you're inputting that vibration level into there. And you'll get results. Um, you'll run your analysis and get your results for that. And then you uh, build your spacecraft or your car or, or whatever you're working with, and, and then comes testing. And this is where you're checking to make sure the your design that you built actually can survive, that you actually uh, designed it correctly, analyzed it correctly, and it survives. So you go ahead and you're, you're going back, you're always going back to those requirements. So for your random vibration input, you might take specific components of the spacecraft, you put them on a shaker table, again, kind of that base driven idea, and you'll shake them for that profile and make sure it survives. For an entire spacecraft, you might be connecting it to a shaker table and running a sine vibration from zero to 100 hertz. And that, those are the types of analyses, those are the type of tests that we're trying to match with our analysis, which then going back to the requirements again, are the levels that we need to meet be, to make sure our spacecraft, our design, our component, um, whatever we're working with survives the environment that it's gonna be operating in. Now let's talk a little bit about what the benefits of a more efficient design process are, because that's what I'm I'm pitching to you today is a, a more efficient, uh, faster, uh, better solution. So you've probably seen some curves like this where over the development cycle time, market cycle time, your costs committed go up and you have the cost of change um, increases. Uh, significantly as you're going in time and the ease of change, um, it gets harder and harder to change your design and go back. So we like to think of tools like the 
structural analysis toolkit as something that it can help you move to the left on that ease of change, cost of change curve. Um, often with something like complicated, like random vibe analysis, if it takes a lot of time to do, um, you're maybe only going to do it once. If it if it takes a long time to set up, a long time to accomplish. When things are faster, you can do them more quickly. You can get rec results faster. You have less setup to do ahead of time. And you can do it more often as need be and make faster design cycles and design changes. And that's what we really hope um, you can do with a tool like Structural Analysis Toolkit. So let's uh, intro the toolkit here. Uh, the toolkit for, is for NASTRAN. It is fast and accurate, random and sign, base-driven solution for NASTRAN normal mode. So you're, you're starting with an OP2, the output file from a solution 103 for NASTRAN. That's your normal mode solution. It accounts for the non-Gaussian probability distributions. It computes peak composite failure metrics. That's a key differentiator from our tool and many other random vibe uh, processors. It can officially count, efficiently account for modal truncation if you're familiar with NASTRAN and the ResVec option. It can generate stress margins of safety, processes very large results, greater than one terabyte. And it's been in development here at Maya since 1998. It's a it's a tool that we continually look to develop and improve as, as the years go on. And again, it's it's supporting um, NASTRAN. So, you know, SimCenter, MSC NASTRAN, all the flavors of NASTRAN. It directly manipulates an OP2 file. That's the output file. You can work it with Windows and Linux. Uh, you can look at the results directly in FEMAP or SimCenter 3D. It runs in batch, and it can create some automated reports as well, HTML, Excel, text, etc. Now, the key thing I want you to take away from today probably is uh, the SA Toolkit is fast. So here we have a model. This is a sample model we did of um, about 160,000 nodes, 130,000 elements. There's a mix of 1, 2, 3D isotropic, 2D laminates. We had uh, 34 modes, in the 0 to 125 hertz frequency range. OP2, that's a results file of uh, 1.5 gigabytes for, for this model with the 34 nodes. So when we run this in something like Nastran Solution 111, Abacus, uh, or the ANSYS random vibe processors, it's going to take uh, 30 minutes or more to get the RMS stresses. If we run this same model through Structural Analysis Toolkit, we can get those results in about eight seconds. That's the level of speed that we're talking about here. In this instance, uh, 200 times faster than Nast Nastran products and other major FEA solvers. It's very fast. Now, in within, I'm talking a lot about the random vibration toolkit, and I'll continue to do so because that is really where the key benefits and speed are. But there's lots of other useful tools and features in this toolkit as well. Sign vibration, um, the modal summary, we have an energy processor, stress, grid point forces and joints, element forces, mass summary. Um, lots of useful tools that you'll find to be able to implement into your workflow as you see fit. And before we dig into random vibration a little more, let's ask another question here. I'd like to know what your biggest pain points are when setting up, running, and post-processing random and sign vibration analysis. So I opened the poll there, and I'll let you guys um, respond to the poll see some answers coming in. Always interesting to see uh, what frustrates people the most. Okay, good results coming in. I'll close the poll here and uh, maybe 
another five, 10 seconds. All right, close the poll, we'll share that here. So, um, you know, developing an accurate but coarse enough model, uh, confusing, complicated setup. Uh, those are pain points I've run into myself for sure. Um, can't easily get the results you want, um, also true. And uh, yeah, some people um, just getting started, getting familiar with random and sign vibe. Um, Definitely a lot of the pain points I've seen as well. Go ahead and hide that. We'll continue on here. So I'd like to discuss a little bit, um, a little more of the details of how the Structural Analysis Toolkit works and what it can do for you. So start with um, the modal processor, just to give you some examples of some of the output. So this provides insight to your modal response analysis. So you've done your modes run, um, often I will uh, spit out my modes or my partic model participation factors, have an Excel chart or something like that. We do offer that um, automatically for you. You can automatically um, spit out an Excel file with all of that with the Structural Analysis Toolkit. You don't have to build that yourself. Helps give insight into your model. The energy processor I like you can have groups in the model. So these are groups I created of different uh, materials or different parts and components of a spacecraft. And you can see for all the modes, uh, which modes are it, where you're seeing kinetic energy for which modes and in which groups. This really helps you kind of investigate your model and, and pinpoint areas of interest as you're working on your design and analysis. And talking about the sign processor, again, this is a uh, efficient and accurate bass-driven harmonic vibration simulation. <clears throat> it analytically determines phase-consistent von Mises stresses. So the maximum possible von Mises is computed for any phasing of the stress tensor components. That's important. The, you can parallelize this. You can run it in batch and the results are accurate using the Nastran eigenvectors. You can compute von Mises stress, um, the associated failure matrices, composite ply stresses and failure metrics, take handles the modal truncation as we talked about. And for the general results, um, you know, your accelerations, your stress tensors, SA Toolkit gives the same answers as Nastran Solution 111. So it's the same answers, you just give them faster. <clears throat> the random processor, again, is efficient and accurate, base-driven random vibration simulation, uses some state-of-the-art integration schemes. That's part of why it's so fast. The peak results correspond to a user-defined confidence level. So that's your, you know, you'd normally we're looking at our three sigma responses. Again, you can parallelize this, you can run it in batch. And again, the, the results are accurate and match solution 111 for the standard acceleration stress tensors. Um, but in addition, it has fast and accurate von Mises stress computation, and it offers composite ply stresses and failure metrics, which you can't get out of Nastran or a lot of other commercial codes as well. <clears throat> To talk a little bit about um, random and sign vibration theory um, and, and kind of how this ties into the toolkit, I'm going to talk first about the types of vibration that, that we're discussing here today. So sign vibration, that's a, uh, if, we were, if we were to try and sort out all types of vibration here, that's a deterministic vibration. That means the amplitude is known at any given time. It's periodic, so it's repeating, and it's a single sinusoidal function. Um, you know, side vibration, just think of a sine wave. Now, random vibration, it's random, as the name would imply. It's the amplitude can't be known at any time, any one time. It is stationary, though, so a, a mean and standard deviation are independent of time. It's ergodic. 
That means the probability of the information from a single sample is applicable to the entire uh, group. Um, that's important because that means, okay, you have a random vibration history. If you take a decent enough time sample, you can be ensured that that sample of time is representative of all other times in the environment. Um, and that's important. That's what we build upon. And, and for vibrational purposes, that covers most of the types of vibration that we look at in engineering analysis. Now, uh, random theory a little bit here. Um, so you, again, we're talking about taking um, samples of data and we have basically a, a random response. So we'll take a time history. This is your amplitude, your, your acceleration over time. And what we're doing when we're coming up with random inputs are basically sort of counting instances um, above certain limits and creating a Gaussian probability distribution. Um, this is the, you might also have heard this called like a bell curve. And basically we're just counting this up. We're uh, counting up the amount of times the um, time history exceeds certain levels. So you'll see uh, a lot of times we're talking about the root mean square RMS. This is the one sigma. So the 68% or so of the responses of the time history will be within this range. And in engineering often, especially in the spacecraft industry, we're looking to design for the three sigma level or what we refer to as peak, which means that 99.7% of all the time history will fall within that range. <clears throat> now, random analysis, uh, there are non-Gaussian responses. So we're talking about the time history itself is a zero mean um, Gaussian response. But there, there are certain things that we're trying to calculate, like von Mises stresses, which are always positive, composite failure metrics, and nodal vector magnitudes that don't follow this zero mean uh, Gaussian distribution. They're, they're something different. So how do we calculate those and how are those usually calculated? Um, again, the issue is usually most commercial codes were, will consider this zero mean. So what that means is they can calculate the RMS for root mean square, um, but then often to calculate the peak or in, in this instance, we wanna say three sigma, the three times the RMS, they just multiply the RMS times three. So if you have something, this is an actual uh, von Mises probability density function that we ran for a model. And you can see if you just took the RMS value, that again, that's that about 68% mark and multiplied by three, uh, you would be way out here. You'd actually would over protect by about 20%. Um, versus the peak, your three sigma, your 99.7% would be a little lower. So in this case, if you actually were trying to design to the three sigma value in this instance, uh, you would over design your part or your spacecraft or your component. Um, you'd have it be too heavy, it'd be more material than it's needed or, or whatever over designing means for your component. The solution for that SATK uses, uh, we have an advanced stress algorithm. So it actually, it determines the actual distribution of the derived results. So just like this, it's not take, assuming it to be zero mean Gaussian. So you don't ever have to just take your RMS and multiply by three. If you say you want to have a three sigma response, it will actually solve this peak for you. And it's the only commercial random solver to compute the to compute this and to do it for the composite for the laminate composite first ply failure indices strength ratios margins of safety um, <clears throat> and this is important because this this overshoot this could be wrong in either direction we've seen instances in composites where it under predicted 
um, what if you just multiplied your RMS by three, it under predicts. So then you're not designing your part properly um, because the peak, the 99.7%, the three sigma would actually be higher. So going back to the performance a little bit, if we're looking at the speed that this tool offers, you can see if you're looking, we're comparing SA Toolkit to the standard NAS Trans Solution 111. If you're, if you're asking for accelerations for 161,000 nodes, it's about a 3,000, SA Toolkit's about 3,000 times faster. You can compute that in about eight seconds versus you know, 24,000 seconds for solution 111. For stresses for about 110,000 elements, 11,000 times faster. And then things like the um, acceleration stress, force, principal stresses, um, key things, failure indices, margin of safety, laminate strength ratio. This is this is asking for all this at once, all these results at once. It took about three minutes for SA Toolkit. Um, Solution 111 can't even provide some of these results. So again, speed, um, faster, faster turnaround. You can do more. You can do your random analysis more often. You can do it with um, more complicated models. Um, it just gives you better performance overall. Another key issue that we solved, when you're trying to define the random excitation frequencies, so if you've done random vibration analysis, you'll know you often have to specify the frequencies at which you want to calculate that. Uh, that'll be, so you'd be inputting things like your FREC1 cards and your FREC3 cards and choosing the frequencies at which you'll do those integrations. And that's important because if you miss a peak, if you're slightly off, your results can be different. In this case, uh, you know, you have a PSD with more inputs um, the one with less, but the one with less is actually more accurate um, because it just gets the peak frequencies correctly. <laughs> with SA Toolkit, you don't have to do any of that. There's no more inputting the FREC cars. There's no more choosing the frequencies. Actually chooses these excitation frequencies, integrates at them for you to give you accurate results every time. So you can be assured that you're getting your results accurately and efficiently. We'll do one more question here before we jump into the demo. <clears throat> I want to ask, what software do you use for random or assigned vibration analysis? Obviously, here at Maya, we are primarily using SimCenter 3D, Nastran, FEMAP. I'm curious to see what, um, always curious to see what everyone else has used as well. I've used ANSYS in the past getting some results in here. I'll give it a few more seconds as people click in results, then we'll close the poll. All right, we'll go ahead and close and share that with you. So actually a majority of you here today are using Maya's structural analysis toolkit. That's great, you're already taking advantage of the speed and accuracy and efficiency. Um, some of you using FEMAP with Nastran. Um, I've definitely done that in the past. And then there's a group using other codes as well. So let's go ahead and do a demo, shall we? Um, if I pull up NX, uh, you can see here I have a model. Um, so this is just a model, dummy model we created of an antenna. It's actually uh, primarily a composite. I've created some groups in here. Um, so you have, uh, you know, the front dish, the main components are composite. You have an aluminum horn here in the middle and just some, you know, 1D elements in there as well. I have already run my modal solution. Um, so you can see the, I have the modes already. That's the input to the structural analysis toolkit. And then I am going to go ahead and jump over to our structural analysis toolkit that I have open and show you how to use that. 
So again, what we'll do, we'll go ahead and open that OP2. This is the results file from your Nastran Solution 103 modal. I've opened that up. And then a key feature that's very useful um, is you can import the groups as well. So I had, you saw I had different groups here. I can import those from the Nastran file, or if you're using FEMAP, you can import them from there directly. That just comes from the input. And now, uh, again, I'm primarily going to be focusing on the random analysis here today. You can see the other tools you can use. And the uh, when you read in the results file as well, it'll actually, you can see some are grayed out. It's because I didn't request some of the forces required for those. So it's smart enough to tell if your, if your inputs, if you can actually use that process or not. You see all the ones that are open to me right now. Let's start with the random. The first we have to define our input. I'm going to go ahead and import a curve that I already created. You can see just a simple dummy curve I created. Uh, didn't pull it from anywhere, made it off the top of my head, but something reasonable. I do need to add a scale factor for the units of gravity. My, uh, my model's in millimeters, so I need to add 9,810. And I'll go ahead and click apply. So we've created one load case in the X direction with that input. I'm going to have, go ahead and create another load case. I want it to be in the Y direction. We'll actually just initialize it from the other one so I don't have to re-input everything. You can also put the um, PSD in point by point if you would like. And then we'll finish it out with uh, we've done X and Y. We might as well do Z. We'll initialize that as well. So again, from the previous output, there we go. Now frequencies, this is just asking you, do you want to include all the modes? Do you want to include a subset of modes or such? We'll include all the modes we have here. This is where you can include those residual static contributions if you want. Modal damping, I'll keep the standard, uh, this is amplification factor, so I'll keep the standard 2% damping. That's good for this. And analysis parameters. This is where you can choose, you know, do, are you looking for three sigma? You can enter it as either a confidence level or your three sigma. All your recommended hybrid methods, the schemes, the uh, peak von Mises methods, usually going to stay with the standard default responses there. Now let's create a stress case manager. So this is to create stress cases for our margins of safety. You can do this by group. This is where reading in the groups helps. So I'll create one for that aluminum horn in there. And again, the, the units are a little weird. They're in uh, kilopascals. So I'll put in, let's call that the ultimate for my aluminum. 1.5 is good. We've got that. We've created our stress case for the aluminum. And see some outputs. So again, margin of safety. Um, you can generally you can ask for text outputs, UNV or neutral files if you're using FEMAP, uh, Excel. Uh, but most for the most part, reading into SimCenter, I'm going to be using the binary here. And I, if there were separate stress cases I'd created, you could choose separate groups. I'll click all there. And basically, we're just going through here. We're choosing all the results we want. Again, um, I want some accelerations. I'll take those and I'll add positive crossings. It's useful if you're doing fatigue. And again, that scalar factor for the units of gravity. And I just want to do this for everything. But then in addition, I want to come back. I want to see some PSDs. And I actually have a group of Excel nodes because I don't want to write PSDs for every single node in the model. There's just some key ones. Often you set this to if you knew you were doing a test later, you'd set it to ones where you knew you were putting Excel accelerometers on. So I'll add that. I'm doing uh, HTML here and the binary, so I can look at them in SimCenter or an HTML file afterwards. Let's look at some stresses. We'll go back to just the peak. Again, peak, that's the three sigma, the binary there. Um, and let's limit this to, let's just do that aluminum horn again. 
and the composite failure metrics. I said there's a lot of composites in this. Um, let's give that a good safety factor and we'll pick some of our composite groups here that we're using front dish, back dish, and show those. So we'll go ahead and click OK here, XY plotting. You can just choose how you want to see the PSDs. Um, again, this isn't how it's solving. Um, so don't worry, you don't have to pick your FREC1, FREC2. This is just what points are you plotting for the PSDs only. So we'll click OK. We will click OK, and you're actually ready to solve. I'll go ahead and click Solve here. It's, it's starting. This one will actually take, uh, I think it's been taking 14, 16 seconds, primarily because half the spot time is just spent writing uh, PSD output pictures that I requested, because I requested quite a few. Also forgot to limit it to the uh, limit it to just the translations. I think I'm outputting rotations for some reason too. All right, let's go ahead and look at some of our results. So if we come over here first, um, let's look at where we have our results. I clicked away from where I was. Uh, one thing I like. Um, this is just a personal preference. You can pop this up and we spit out plots of the PSDs. I like this because it's just quick. It's a quick check. I don't even have to read it into anything. I don't have to read it in Excel or anything. And I can kind of check, make sure, okay, am I getting my input right? Am, am I getting the response kind of where I'm at? Uh, and again, uh, SATK, it runs really fast. If I screwed something up, um, occasionally make a mistake, you can come in and just rerun it really quick. Um, it's just a nice quick check that I like. But now if we're looking to import this into our model, I'm gonna go up and we'll just create a new dummy solution that we can put results into. And we will go ahead and load or specify our results. Now you can see now I have, in addition to the solution 103 OP2, I have a random OP2 that was created by SA Toolkit. <clears throat> we'll read that. And then we'll add uh, companion results for this to, the, to add some of the other results that you get as well. And we can go over and actually look at these results. <clears throat> at first, actually, let's go to the, um, if I want to plot some results, I'll go ahead and open those up just because we were looking at the plots previously. You can actually look at your plots in here as well. Um, I really like this. Uh, you can come in, plot different results. You can pull a few different ones together and kind of plot them uh, overlaid on top of each other. Oops, wrong one, sorry. So you can plot them kind of on top of each other to look at it. We have a bit of a weird model going on here. So the units are just change the units to log. You can look at that, plot different ones on top of each other. Now, if we go back to the results that we were actually getting in the model itself, um, let me open this up a little bit so we can see here. So here you can see some of my uh, stress results on the horn that I requested. So elemental and nodal. Um, you can also see uh, if we open that up, you got your ply failure index. You can see that I requested it for the front and the back. So those are some of our composite results. You can get number of zero crossings if you're looking at for fatigue purposes. You have accelerations on the model. And this instance is in, uh, currently in millimeters per second squared. You can change that to uh, Gs if you'd like. Percent margin of safety. Again, I asked for margin of safety on this aluminum horn and uh, get ply margin of safety as well. So you see all these results that you can pull in. I did this all in one run. I got all these results, the HTMLs, the results in here. And it took us about 16 seconds and maybe 30 seconds of setup in there. So pretty simple overall. And that's the 
that's the whole purpose. And it's it's fast and it's accurate results. So that uh, concludes my demo. Um, and I just wanna close kind of close up here before we uh, take some questions um, at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to start writing those if you haven't already in the chat there. But I just wanna close by um, again, hitting on the main points for this structural analysis toolkit. It's a best in class tool for simulation of base driven random and sign vibration. It's unprecedented performance. It's very fast. It, it, there's many different reasons it's fast, but for our purposes at the moment, we just care that it's really fast. And then it's also unprecedented accuracy. We talked about the fact that some of those non-zero mean Gaussian responses like the von Mises, um, and it calculates those accurately for three sigma. It doesn't just multiply by th the RMS by three. It gives you laminate ply failure metrics, which you can get from other solvers as well. Um, so it's fast, it's accurate. Um, we find at Maya it really helps our workflow, helps us to be able to do analyses like this faster, get design results faster, and iterate more often. And it saves on the pre-processing setup. You don't have to do things like, okay, I've got a stress model, but it's too many nodes and elements for my random, so I need to reduce it to something smaller because I don't want to take days solving my random. No, I just use the same model. It can handle it because it does it so fast. Uh, in closing, I do want to ask one last question before we get into the other questions in there. I wanted to ask, how would you prefer to learn more about Structural Analysis Toolkit? Open up the poll there. Um, we're always open to talking to um, people one-on-one, uh, -on -one, trainings. We offer training and software evaluations. Uh, we offer help. We offer some videos on our website and some more that we we'll, we'll kind of offer on demand to help use it and help guide you. And we also do free local in-person workshops. Those are starting to come back a little bit. See people answering in their poll questions there. Go ahead and close and share those. So a majority of you training and software evaluations. Um, my team does a lot of that. We use the toolkit ourselves and also offer trainings. Um, we either sort of on-demand videos or uh, actual guidance, um, live guidance, instructor-led guidance. One-to-one um, -one meetings, we're happy to set up, or any other meetings if you guys want, just reach out to us. So I'll go ahead and hide those. Um, that concludes the webinar for today. And now I wanted to open it up and just ask if anybody had any questions. Um, you can type the questions in on the, uh, there's a place to type in questions. We'll see what we have here. Let me look, I see a couple questions. Uh, how many degrees of freedom are in the demo model? Uh, that's a good question. I, the model I was using in Nastran um, in Sim Center that was about 35,000 modes or nodes, sorry, uh, 39,000 elements, mostly P comp laminates. Um, the modal run took about on my machine. I've got a pretty good workstation laptop. The modal run took about two and a half minutes, and then you guys saw it solved the random vibe in about. 16 seconds with all the results. <laughs> Let's see, other questions? I feel free to type in more if you have any as we go. Uh, do you get the same results as Nastran Solution 111? Yes, yeah, we do. Um, at least for the results that Nastran Solution 111 can handle, um, we do get the same results. So your standard accelerations, um, obviously for things like like I mentioned, the von Mises stress, and we we calculate the three sigma more accurately 
the peak results more accurately because we calculate the actual distribution. Um, and then the composite failure matrix, uh, Nastran doesn't provide those. Let's see. Uh, looks like I've only got one more question. Um, could you explain with a little more detail why Structural Analysis Toolkit is so much faster than Nastran? Um, Oh, this is, uh, we cover some of this in a white paper that we offer. If you, if you want to, would like to receive that, let us know. But I mean, in a nutshell, it's, it's a really high performance. We use high performance integration schemes, um, use von Mises stress strain estimations that are very accurate. We can parallelize this. Um, and the structural analysis toolkit is just a really efficient OP2 reader as well. That's the, uh, again, that's the Nastran results. I think that's all the questions I see. So I will go ahead and close this. I want to thank you all for attending today. Um, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, again, some of you were interested in sort of training software, one-to-one -one meetings. Please feel free to reach out to myself or to Maya as well. Um, we'd be happy to help you and get you set up and let you evaluate the Structural Analysis Toolkit and see how it can improve your workflow as well. So thank you very much. Um, I wish you all a good rest of the day and goodbye.